vicious cruelty and greed ends in the bloodbath of revenge by the black underworld in this gripping novel by the greatest ghetto writer ever. Hey folks, welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe to the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On this edition of Ralph Reads, I shall bring this novella, Never Die Alone, by Donald Goines, to a close. Let the reading commence. Chapter 12 the early morning hours had slipped away and Paul found himself still awake. He stood up slowly and stretched his long arms over his head. Next, he bent down and touched his toes, trying to shake out the cramps he had gotten from sitting in the same position too long. It was still too early for the morning laborers to be rising. It was that time that you could call the in-between time. The night people were starting to make their way in for the night, while those people with early morning jobs were just reaching over and turning off their alarm clocks. Paul went into the kitchen and put on a fresh pot of coffee. It was sort of surprising to him to find out that he had consumed the whole pot. Usually, one pot would last two or three days. As he worked, his mind kept returning to the diary. King David had been one hell of a man, he reflected as he waited for the coffee to heat up. Paul made a useless trip to the icebox, knowing beforehand that there was nothing inside of it that he could eat. He still opened it out of habit and let his eyes roam around the empty shelves. The only thing the refrigerator contained was an old pop bottle that still had a small portion of pop. Paul made a face and closed the refrigerator door. The sound of the coffee pot steaming came to him suddenly, and he knew it was ready. He quickly poured out a cup, then returned to his bed. Lighting up a cigarette first, then setting the ashtray in easy reaching distance, he picked up the diary and settled back to resume his reading. Janet and her crowd have gone from snorting to shooting dope now. It won't be long before the wheels come off the wagon. I just about reached one of my goals in the past two years, so money ain't the problem. I ain't never had the kind of money I've got now. I need 10,000 more dollars before I'll have the amount of money I set out to get. At times I feel as if I should forget about trying to reach $50,000, but I'm stubborn as hell. I could freeze right now and never look back. Selling dope is a job. You don't know who to trust. And it's getting so bad that your very life is on the line. If things get any worse, I might just stop altogether and try something else. The next entry was dated a week later. Just came back from Mexico. And I must say, them bitches down there are out of sight. But if you don't speak the language, you're in trouble. We went down there to check out a connection. But I don't trust the fucking Mexican that I met. I went to Nut City on them, cause I don't give a fuck! It will be something else if I needed it, but who needs the headache? Not me, that's for damn sure! The drugs he showed us was supposed to be able to take an 8 cut. Now, if I could step on my dope 8 times, wow, this nigga would get rich! But that's the hang up as far as I'm concerned. It's too sweet, except for the fact that the Mexican won't deliver it across the goddamn border. The honky I'm partnering up with on this deal still wants to go for it. He believes we can get it out. I'll have to think on the matter a little more. If I could put some faith in the Mexican, I might just go for it. Bill, my partner, still wants to make the buy in Mexico. If we spend four grand a piece, we can get a kilo. Now, that is one hell of a deal when you stop and think about it. If we come up with a kilo that we can step on eight times, that will give us eight kilos. Now that's what I would call a hell of a amount of dope. I ain't never had that much stuff on my hands in my life, and I don't think I want it now. Bill is a user. I just found that out. 
Even though that doesn't make that much difference, it still gives me an insight into why he wants to close this deal so fucking bad. I know it sounds good, but I also realize that if we make the buy, we still will have to get the drugs out of Mexico, and that's a fucking job. Goddamn. Janet and Bill are bugging the shit out of me to get some cash out so they can get this sweet fucking deal. Don't know why, but I'm still not sure I want any part of it. For one thing, I don't really need that much stuff. It may sound sort of silly, but I'm afraid to have that much dope around. SHIT! If I've made it as far as I've made it without coming close to getting busted or ever having that much stuff on hand, why the fuck should I change my style of dealing now? God damn! We had a hell of a roll when I told Bill and Janet that I wasn't going through with it. Shit! You would have thought that I took their last dollar from them or something! I had to threaten that honky Bill! I told him I step off in his ass if he called me out of my fucking name! I ain't about to let nobody, I mean nobody, force me into nothing I don't like! It ain't the money! Hell, if that was the case, I'd give them the four grand and let them take all the risks. But that ain't the case. If them goddamn Beckerwoods get busted and I get my money up tied with them, shit. The next time I open my door, the police would more than likely be there. So I didn't want any part of it. Bill stopped by and told me he was going to cop without me. Just to keep my finger in the pie, I gave him a grand. I did this for insurance. After giving him the grand, I made myself entitled to know his plans. I also told him I didn't want Janet in it. That was my excuse for not getting down all the way. He went for it the same way a fly heads for shit. Janet came over tonight steaming mad. It seems as if Bill told her what I said. Good! I pulled her coat to the real deal. I don't want her involved, not because I care for the bitch or anything like that, because she is the only one in the crowd who knows anything about me. So I don't want anything, and I mean nothing, to happen to her. Bill and his woman Dolores left today for Mexico. They stopped by and I gave them the thousand dollars I promised. I also told them to deliver my share of the dope to Janet's pad. I don't want them coming here. Again, this was nothing but the fake out. As soon as they left, I went back in my bedroom and picked up my suitcases. It just goes to show, I don't trust a motherfucking body. I moved the same day and cut the phone off. I moved to another apartment, one that nobody knows about, not even Janet. This is the best protection I could think of to put on myself. As of now, I don't need it. But you can never tell when you're dealing with addicts and their drugs. Billy left Monday afternoon for Mexico. Now, three days later, the shit is in the fan. Gerald, the square nigga who stays in the apartment across from the one I moved out of, told me what I had been halfway expecting. I called him this evening. He works days in some kind of factory, but he got the news from his wife when he came home from work. It seems as if half of Los Angeles' finest detectives raided my whole apartment. Now, I'm not sure it's related to the trip that Billy made. I can't think of any other motherfucking reason for the police to come storming into where I had lived. From the information that I've been able to gather, the boys in blue were put out because I hadn't sat still and waited for them. If it hadn't been for me using a little foresight, I think I would have been behind bars at this moment instead of writing these notes down. I had to post Bond to get Janet out of a fucking bus that shouldn't have ever happened. But better her than me. I had my lawyer swing the deal because I don't want to get involved. From what I can gather, the police are looking for some nigga named King David. Maybe I'll have to change my white slave name and pick me a real soul brother tag. Maybe I'll start calling myself Mr. X. That's as cool as any other. I lost a thousand dollars on that deal, but I retained my freedom, so it was worth it. Janet wants to suck my ass because I saved her dumb ass from getting busted. 
If I allowed her to go along with silly ass Billy, she would be uptight in Mexico, the same as Billy and his woman. Now that's tough shit. It still ain't no reason for the bastard to be snitching the way he is. He had to give them Janet's address or they wouldn't have been able to bust her. It cost me six $25 balloons when they busted Janet. The dumb bitch was laying up nodding when they came in on her so she couldn't clean up. Well, it's her ass, not mine. I'm just glad she didn't have my new address because they just might have caught me dirty. If not dirty, they would have kept all the cash money they found or tied it up so that I wouldn't have been able to use it for the next five years. The white man is a motherfucker. If a nigga had any hopes of ever getting ahead, he had better learn how to play the white man's game to only use his own rules. That's the trick. Use your own rules. Now, I know I've been in Los Angeles about as long as I can last. If I stay here much longer, I'm gonna get knocked out of the box. Even with the setback and the rest of the shit I gain while losing. Now, I'm only five or six grand away from having my full $50,000. I put in my order for a new Cadillac. It shouldn't be long now. Paul sat straight up in the bed. 50000 the thought of the money flashed through his mind, but Paul shook the idea away. Maybe at the time he wrote in the diary he had it, but now, no way. Paul glanced up at the top of the page in the diary. January 10th, 1973. Just a few months ago, what could have happened to the money if what he had been reading in the diary was true? The money should be somewhere around. It had to be. Paul glanced at his hand and noticed he was trembling. Hell, this crap he was reading was bullshit that King David wrote down to pass the time away. Paul got up and fixed a fresh cup of coffee. He didn't even notice how light it was getting in the room. What the hell, Paul reasoned. If there was any truth in what he read, the diary should give him a key to where the money was. He went back to the bed and reopened the diary. This time his interest was more than just curiosity. Greed was mixed with it. King David's next entry revealed the foresight the man had had. Since moving, Janet has no way of getting in touch with me. That's cool, because I know the cops are watching her. I rapped with her on the phone, but got tired of listening to the bitch beg. She's supposed to be sick. Tough shit! It ain't my problem if she was silly enough to let herself get strung out. This crazy bitch had the nerve to tell me that it was my fault she was a junkie. It's hard to believe, but that's what she says. Well, I do feel sort of responsible for her, so I left her a small package at the motel where I first met her. Yes, it just goes to show that I've really got a heart. She doesn't know it yet. But that was the last time we will ever do anything together. So, it was sort of like a going away package for me. I left her a piece of stuff. It's worth over $500. So if Janet uses any kind of sex, she would be able to get herself through with it. Shit, ain't nobody ever did nothing like that for me. Turned up and gave me something. Shit, no way. Never, ever. Now, I have got problems. Juanita is acting up. I had hoped to do something for the bitch, like break both her legs before I left or something like that. I got her strung out damn good. And I know she's been turning tricks to keep up her habit. But that ain't enough for me. I want to see that dirty bitch wallow in mud before I leave. But it don't look like I'm going to get the chance to see it. I might as well put the truth down, since I'm the only one who will ever see this while I'm living. I got weak at the last moment. Yep, I still found myself drawn to the dirty bitch even though she had damn near spit on me. Well, I offered her a chance again, even though I knew she was a junkie. Now, can you imagine a dope fiend ass bitch turning down a sure thing? I told her I'd help her with her habit, but instead of that making her happy, she screamed on me. Help me? I'd rather have help from a snake. 
If it wasn't for you, you bastard, I wouldn't be in the shape I'm in now. Well, from the words, it wasn't hard for me to figure out that she was hip to the fact that I had handed her heroin for coke until she was strung out. But still, it was too much for me when she cursed at me. King David, you low-life motherfucker, you! If it were any way possible, I'd see to it that the police jammed your ass in jail and kept you there until the fucking walls fell down! Yeah, I think those are just about her correct words. Even when I write them down, I get that cold feeling that practically strangled me the day she tossed them in my face. When she talked about police, I knew the bitch was dangerous, but I still wouldn't have wasted any time on her. I didn't think there was anything she could pin on me. I can still remember the day she called crying and told me she was sick, but it wouldn't be for long. If she could only get a favor that morning, she would be alright because she had called the Bricks Foundation and they were going to send somebody over to pick her up. Yeah, the bitch was going to the hospital to kick. She was planning on getting that monkey off her back once and for all. It was as if someone had tossed cold water in my face. Kick! If the whore ever kicked, she would be back where she began. I knew I couldn't have that. I had to make the funky black bitch pay for her arrogant ways. Ain't a bitch alive ever treated me the way she had, and now she was planning on kicking. The only thing that I had on her was the knowledge that I had strung her out, and I knew that as long as she remained a junkie, she would catch pure hell. So I made my plans accordingly. She was committing herself that afternoon. It didn't leave much time. I was supposed to be picking up my new ride that morning too, so I went into the bedroom and started to pack. As I stacked the 50 grand neatly in my bag, I made my final plans for her. Paul reread the sentence about the money, then leapt up from the bed and ran to the closet where he had shoved the other small suitcases without opening them. He carried a bag back to the bed and tried to open it, but found a small lock on it. He didn't bother to check the keys on the key ring. He just took a small knife and forced the lock. The clothes stacked neatly on top were shoved to the side. As soon as he moved them, Paul saw the first bundle of money. He held his breath and then started to take them out one at a time. For a long time afterward, Paul just sat on the edge of the bed and stared at the money. It was the first time he had ever seen so much of it. He didn't even bother to count it. If King David said there was $50,000 there, he believed there was more. Fifty thousand dollars. Paul had trouble getting over the shock of it. Then his mind went back to what he had been reading and he wondered about what had happened to the girl. She had caught so much hell already just for having been unlucky enough to have met King David. For him to be crazy enough to have done something to her was too much for Paul to believe. King David had to have been mad, Paul believed. The man had surely been insane. Paul stacked the money back like he found it, then pushed the suitcase under the bed. Then he reopened the diary. Since I don't have that much time, I decided to make my moves all at one time. The dope that I had left, I fixed up into another package and put it between a folded newspaper. I called Janet and told her I had another package for her and where she could go pick it up. The next thing I did was to pick up the small package of raw dope that I had and fix it up for Juanita. Since it was pure, I didn't worry about it too much. But just so that I wouldn't take any chances, I made a trip down to my old caddy and opened the hood up and scraped some of the white battery acid off the battery. I took this back upstairs to my apartment and reopened the small package of dope. I shook the acid out and mixed it up until I couldn't even tell the difference between it and the pure dope. To make sure everything was going to go right, I called Juanita up and told her I'd bring her some stuff, but she had to be by herself. Being so self-centered, the bitch instantly thought that I wanted to bet her down and, like a true dope fiend, came up with a story instantly. 
I'm on my period, David. She said, lying through her motherfucking teeth. Yeah, I answered. But ain't nothing wrong with your head, is it? I was just playing along, letting her silly ass think I really wanted her. To cap it off, I asked her, was she sure she wanted some stuff since she was going in the hospital that day? I played my cards to a T, knowing dope fiends the way that I did. I knew she couldn't turn down that last fix. None of them can, not while they are still strung out. She tried to fight it. For a minute, I thought I might have overspotted my hand, mentioning the hospital to her. Since she had made up her mind to go in the hospital, I knew she was tired of using, but the attraction of the drug won out. Okay, David, she answered in a weak voice. I'll be here. You're not going to be too long, are you? She asked in that lost little girl voice she sometimes used. Don't worry about a thing, Mama, I answered, then hung up. I checked the small package out once more. Then I took all my bags downstairs and put them in the car. After that, I went back upstairs and wiped everything off, hoping that I didn't leave any prints. Though there was really no reason for this, I did it anyway, being on the safe side and all that shit. It took me a few minutes to drive the freeway. Then I was parking a few doors down from my house. Again, there was no reason for me to be careful since I was trading the old Cadillac in on a new model in another hour. But I used caution anyway. Practice makes perfect, so they say, so I was careful. Juanita was waiting at the top of the stairs for me. She led me back to her apartment. I checked, making sure nobody saw me as I entered her room. She didn't waste any time. She had a cooker ready, but I put her off. Hey, baby! I yelled. Ain't you forgetting something? She wet her lips. We can take care of that after I get the stuff in me, King. I'm sick right now. Sick my ass! I screamed on her. I don't want no dead head! I said, then burst out laughing. She couldn't dig what was so funny, but I did. Dead head! <laughs> That's just what it would have been. Nah, baby! I stated coldly, then walked over to the couch and flopped down on it. I opened up my pants and pulled out my Jones and let it hang down. You better get a towel or something. I don't want spit all over me. There were real tears in her eyes. I knew she wanted to tell me to kiss her ass, but she didn't have the nerve. She wanted the dope too badly. She went to the bathroom and got the towel. I made her kneel down in front of me. Then I rubbed my dick all over her face until it was covered with her tears. I wanted to fuck her then, real bad. As she started to sob, I pushed her away and fell down on the floor next to her. She was crying loudly now. The sounds of her shame only aroused me. Hey, Mama, you ain't forgot me, have you? I inquired coldly. This is the little man, remember? The one who would never be nothing, or something like that. Right? What was it? I asked as I forced her legs wider. She didn't even have any Kotex inside, so I was right. The bitch had lied. I could feel the soft hairs over her crack, and they aroused me like always. It was at this time that she reminded me of a white girl. She was the first black girl I'd ever betted who had soft hairs on a crack. I rammed my dick up in her, making a grunt from the fucking pain. I'm pretty well hung so I could get a sound or two out of the average woman. With her legs spread as far as I could get them, I started to ride that pussy. She cried like a baby, causing me to bust my nuts before I was ready to come. I wanted to have another nut, but she wasn't about to stand still for it. She wanted to shoot the dope at once. There was nothing I could do to prevent it. I went into the bathroom and washed up, making sure I didn't leave any prints. When I came out, she had the dope cooked up and was scratching for a vein. I started to leave. There was no reason for me to watch it, but she got a hit before I could get out the door. Her eyes were large as she watched me. Then, 
that carried a look of surprise. Her mouth opened as if she wanted to scream, but no sound came. She rubbed wildly at her arm as she snatched the outfit out, then fell over onto her side. She kicked once or twice, then she was perfectly still. I walked over and looked down at her. Snot poured from her nose and a long stream of it fell down on her chin. Her legs were wet from where her bowels had busted up on her. As I stared down at her, a lump of shit came running down her leg. I looked at it, and the thought flashed through my mind that she wasn't so fucking fine after all. After one more glance at Miss Fine and Mighty, I turned on my heel and departed on my way to pick up my new Cadillac. And then from there, I hit the highway. Like I said, Los Angeles and me had had enough of each other. It was time for me to go back to the Big Apple. After all, I've been out here for damn near five years. It's time I slowed down. Maybe now I can settle down and live respectably. Something I've been wanting to do all my life. Chapter 13 That's a beautiful sight, boys, Moon said drawing the other two men's attention to the sky. Look at it. Ain't no artist living can capture that beauty on canvas. No siree. That's something can nothing touch. Hell, Moon, I ain't never figured you for a nature lover, Alvin said with a grin. Now me, I don't ever notice nothing until I get locked up. Then I can see a bird flying and I'll watch it fly. Or wonder about a fucking mouse and figure he better off than me. Yeah. That goddamn jailhouse will make a man notice everything. Shit, Rocky said, not wanting to be left out. I was raised on a farm. What I miss is that country smell, you know? The grass smelling fresh and the wind blowing without the smell of factories in the air. Now that's something ain't nobody able to put together. The real fresh air of the country. What you miss about the motherfucking country, Moon said with that cold wit of his. Is the outhouses and wiping your ass with your thumb cause your poor ass country boy sure in hell can't afford to buy no goddamn toilet paper. All the men laughed loudly at the truth of the statement. Rocky grinned sheepishly. Hell moon, he answered. We didn't have to use our thumb. Hell, any old country boy will tell you all you need is some of that sweet smelling grass. Shucks boss, it's even better than some of this paper you buy up in Harlem. Yeah? If it is, you better change the store you're shopping at, Moon grunted as he leaned over and began to fix himself another drink. You boys want me to fix you something? Yeah, Alvin said quickly. I'll have one, boss. How about a shot of scotch with a dab of milk if you got any? He knew all the time there was milk back there because he stocked the bar. Make mine the same thing, only keep the milk out of it, Rocky stated. Moon mixed the drinks expertly, then passed them over the seat. You boys hurry up and drink them down. We don't want no hassle from no cops if we should be unlucky enough to be stopped by them. Moon drained off his drink, then fixed another one. He closed his eyes and nursed the drink in his lap. At this rate, I'll end up being a fucking rummy, he warned himself. Rocky handed the glasses back over the seat as soon as they finished them. Thanks, boss, he said, smacking his lips to show his appreciation. It ain't every day a nigga like me gets a chance to drink whiskey like this. Rocky, Moon said, you're a goddamn liar. You get a chance to drink good whiskey every day, because whenever you think I ain't looking, you fix a quick one off my bar. Moon glanced at his watch. I'll be glad to reach the pad. I feel like I can sleep the rest of the week. Boys, we're going to have to start going out more. I really enjoyed myself tonight. Hell, I need to get out. Maybe it will help me stop drinking so much. You know, just hanging around the apartment, a man ain't got nothing else to do but take a drink to kill the time. That's our problem. Too much fucking time on our hands. Maybe I'll start going out to the track. Moon's voice had dropped to a whisper as the hard liquor hit him. Alvin glanced in the mirror and shook his head. He sometimes wondered how much liquor Moon could hold without falling out. 
The man seemed to be bottomless. Whiskey didn't affect Moon the way it did other men. He never seemed to get drunk. The only thing it seemed to do to him was make him sleepy. As the long automobile weaved its way through the light morning traffic, another figure waited patiently for its arrival. Mike walked to the corner, then turned around and came back past the apartment building. His steps grew slower as he came abreast of the entrance. Then he continued on. For a minute, he hesitated, undecided on whether or not he should go on up. Maybe Moon was upstairs. Maybe he just sent the big car out to be fixed or something. It wasn't like Moon to stay out all night, so maybe he wasn't out at all. That would be a bitch if Moon was upstairs and had been up there all this time. Mike leaned against the wall. His wounds were acting up. He had lost too much blood. If he continued on like he was doing, he wouldn't have the strength to do the job when the chance arose. Finally, out of desperation, Mike decided to go upstairs and find out for himself. This waiting was too much. He glanced up at the sky. No, it didn't make sense. Moon didn't stay out this late. He couldn't think of anywhere that Moon could be this late. More than likely, he was upstairs in his bed, sleeping like he owned the world. Straightening up, Mike pushed himself away from the wall. He made sure he had himself under control before starting towards the entrance. He didn't want to draw too much attention to himself, so he walked carefully, taking measured steps. The lights inside the lobby almost blinded him. He blinked once or twice, then made his way toward the elevator. Mike wasn't worried about being noticed because he knew the nightman on the desk was aware he worked for Moon. There wouldn't be any unwanted questions, but he was lucky anyway, because the desk clerk had left his station for a minute, and the bellboy on night duty was dozing in a chair. Mike took his time and tiptoed across the large, well-furnished lobby. He stepped into the waiting elevator and pushed a button that would take him to the top floor. The elevator went up without making any noise and stopped on the penthouse floor. Mike walked down to the apartment, then stopped at the door. He checked the pistol in his belt, removed it, and placed it in his coat pocket where he could keep his hand on it. If necessary, he would be able to shoot through his coat. Mike rang the bell with three short bursts, the signal that only members of the gang knew about. Jojo, the Japanese houseboy, opened the door. He stared at Mike. You know it, boss, tonight? He asked. Mike brushed on past him into the apartment. Hell no, Mike answered. Where the hell is Moon? Not really knowing, Jojo shook his head. Me not know. Boss no tell me he gone. He no tell me nothing. Okay, Jojo, you can go to bed. I'll be here when Moon comes back, so don't you worry about it. Good, good, Jojo replied with a short bow, then disappeared into the rear of the apartment where the bedrooms were located. Mike began to feel weak. He stumbled toward the bathroom. Once inside, he pulled his shirt loose and looked at the wounds. He didn't know anything about stopping the cut from bleeding. The only thing he could think of was to wet a washcloth and hold it against the wound. Soon, the heat from the cloth soothed him to such a degree that he found himself nodding on his feet. His head would fall forward for a while, then suddenly he would wake up. He sat down on the toilet seat, his head nodding against his chest. Mike was in that position when Moon and his two gunmen came in. They walked into the apartment and stopped at the bar. Mike was asleep in the bathroom and didn't even wake up. Rocky went behind the bar and poured himself a drink. You want one before turning in, boss? Yeah! Moon answered loudly. I might as well. It helps me to sleep better at night. Rocky filled the two drinks and looked at Alvin, who declined. Alvin then pushed past Rocky and opened the panel. You want your pistol out of there, Rocky? He inquired as he took his own gun down. Nah, I'll get it a little later on. Shit, it felt good not having that weight on me for a change, Rocky said as he finished mixing the drinks and pushed Moon's double shot toward him. Well, I felt naked myself, Alvin replied and stuck his gun in his waistband. 
Moon and Rocky toasted each other, knocking their glasses together. The sound of their voices finally reached Mike in the toilet. He listened for a brief second, then removed his pistol from his coat pocket and started toward the door. He hesitated for a moment, then quietly pushed the bathroom door open and stepped into the living room. The three men didn't see him until he was almost upon them. It wasn't until Alvin saw the gun in Mike's hand that he realized they were in danger. At the look on Alvin's face, Moon spun around on his bar stool. One glance at Mike coming toward them caused Moon's bowels to become loose. The look on the man's face didn't leave any questions. There was murder in his eyes. Moon let out a scream of pure panic and tried to run around the bar. The first shot from Mike's gun took him right between the shoulder blades. A second shot shattered his spine. As he slumped forward, knocking a tray of glasses down, Rocky rushed toward the panel. He managed to push the button, but the sliding door was too slow. Mike's next shot took Rocky in the forehead, knocking him backward against the panel. Before Mike could fire again, Alvin had squeezed off two shots, both of them taking Mike high in the chest. He bounced back off the wall and tried to raise his pistol again, but another bullet smashed into his mouth and he was dead before he hit the floor. Chapter 14 Paul slowly put the diary down. Now he knew everything except why King David was killed. It didn't really matter now, though. After what he had just read, he knew that the man needed killing. He shouldn't have been allowed to live. Now, it was up to Paul to bury him. The very thought of it was repugnant. But he had given his word. He really didn't have to do anything but make the arrangements and then forget about it. But the more he thought about it, the more he decided not to waste too much money on the funeral. Paul slowly dressed. It would have been nice to be able to take the money and go into one of the big men's stores downtown and buy what he wanted. But he didn't believe he could ever wear the clothes in peace. After he got dressed, he picked up the small suitcase that he had put the money into and started for the door. His first stop was a mortuary where he made arrangements to have the body cremated. It was cheaper that way. After he left the funeral home, he drove around slowly, searching for just the right place. Down by 137th Street, he found just what he was looking for. It was a drug center that worked with youths from the city. Paul walked inside and glanced around casually. It was his first time inside such a place. He asked a young girl at the desk for the supervisor, then he sat down and waited for about 10 minutes until a brown-skinned woman came out of a rear office and walked toward him. Paul introduced himself, then she led the way back to her office. The sign on her desk read Mrs. Johnson. Mrs. Johnson, Paul began, I don't want to take up too much of your time. She cut him off. Oh, don't worry about it. That's what we're here for, sir, to help people. She smiled at him openly, and he was sure he had come to the right place. You do work with drug addicts, don't you? Paul inquired seriously. Of course. That was one of our reform girls out there at the desk, Mrs. Johnson said. Good. Good, Paul replied. I have something for you. The only thing I want to be sure of is that you really use it on the drug addicts. Help them to help themselves. I don't care if you give the money to them or buy whatever it is you think they need. At the mention of money, her eyebrows went up. Money? She said in surprise. I don't think I understand you, sir. Paul smiled at her, then set the bag on top of her desk. He flipped it over, and the bundles of money came tumbling out. This is for your people. Use it as you see fit. Paul got up and walked out of the stunned woman's office. Mrs. Johnson stared at the strange man as he walked away. She didn't speak. She was afraid he would change his mind, return, and pick up the money. Mrs. Johnson didn't spend the money right away. She held it for just over a month before spending the first dollar just in case he had come back for it. After Paul left, he got into the Cadillac. Well, he said aloud, I guess I'll keep the car. That much I do on myself. He smiled, then thought about the funeral arrangements. 
Yes, it was the best thing he could have done. Why waste money on expensive funerals when the same money could be used to help some of the people King David had used to get this large sum of money? The junkies who were still alive were damn sure more in need of it than King David and his kind would ever be. We have reached the conclusion of this Donald Goins miniseries on Ralph Reed's. I would like, or rather love, to thank my queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You may reach me on Facebook, Ralph Anthony Garcia, Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at rgmc2407. Email me, rgmc2407 at gmail.com, where, if you would like to leave a small donation, you may use the Zelle app or PayPal via paypal.me forward slash rgmc2407. And the cash app, my cash tag is rgmc2407. You may also find me on my other channel, RGMC, Ralph Garcia, Master of Ceremonies, and of course, right here on the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. <laughs>